live. Okay, that looks like that's working. I just need a second to bring up the uh, chat window. Yes, I understand you have faster moderation. Pop out, okay. Put this over her, make it bigger. Type something. Okay. And now I just want to promote this. Any day now. Any day now. YouTube. I was using restream.io last time. And since I'm not using that anymore, I've had to redo everything. There we go. Live now. I guess I can use that. Can I just copy this URL? Is there a share button? If I shrink this, will it shrink the other window? So many questions. I don't have the answers. Cool. I'm just going to go over and tell people I'm doing this. Okay, so here, this is the beginning, starting now. Um, I have just received today this lovely box, all the way from Switzerland. And in this box, we will see, it says Hobby Electronics. Mm -hmm. Sort of clever Swiss box. Let's see if I can open it properly. I should be using my Swiss Army knife that I purchased in Switzerland. I'm slightly annoyed because there's a wire hanging down here that I, I meant to tape back up before I started. But whatever. Bubble wrap. Pine. Interesting piece. And then, I guess it's all it's all wrapped up together here. Get rid of that. Unroll this. I don't know which batch this is. It's not certainly not the first batch because I. Totally missed that notification. I want to say second or third. All right. This bubble wrap is confusing me. There's some pieces there. Bubble wrap continues. There's a piece there. Uh, oh, I see. Kind of. There it goes. Ah. <laughs> oh. Okay. So there's the circuit board. It. Uh -huh. Pi DP 1170. It's got that black solder mask. And a lot of holes. So if this is anything like the PDP-8, and I suppose it is, the PDP-8, um, <laughs> it's, I'm probably not going to finish this tonight. Um, this must be the 
front panel, or the, not really the front panel, the enclosure. This is cool because the uh, PyDP8 just came with a wooden box, but this has got a nice molded plastic. Does that show up there? Yep. A nice molded plastic thing. So that'll go, and then this is obviously the front. Um, and I'm not going to peel this protective stuff off quite yet because I don't want to get this all scratched. So I will move the case bits out of the way just for the moment. Let's take a closer look at what's in here. This looks like the back panel. Again, very nice, because I didn't have one of those with the previous uh, the PyDP8, um, and it's kind of a mess on the back, but this is nice. Nice back panel with knockouts for the serial port and stuff. Uh, and then we've got, what else have we got here? Um, I don't know what this is. <laughs> piece of uh, PCB with holes in it. And then this obviously for the key switches. I did take a few seconds to start to look at the instructions, but um, all I saw was that there's, there's some sort of a uh, system for holding the switches in place, which is great because it's hard. It's hard to do. Documents enclosed. Oh, this is going to be glorious. Make sure I'm not missing any there. So here are some of these fabulous switches. I don't know that I can switch the uh, toggling. Of course, there are covers on top of these these other switches. So I guess I should start assembling little dishes or something to keep these things in. Um, <laughs> how do I want to do this? I have a lot of trays. I can use one of these iFixit trays. this whole thing live until I get bored and give up. I should actually hmm, I should sort these by color just to make it easier to put them in. Take all the red ones out. there, purple ones up there, and the white one there. Okay. Now we open the other package here. I should go post on the forum that I just got mine in. Live streaming the assembly. Maybe I'll go do that. That would be kind of fun. Hmm. Take a, take a gander. Where is the forum? Forum. Open that. I just want to log in before I uh, do anything here. Let's do this. Okay. New topic. Live streaming my build. So excited. I just got my kit today. I'm going to 
Five stream D. Just started a YouTube live stream of the assembly process. Uh, cool. And I guess I have to go on to YouTube to get my live stream link. Hey, look at that. Let's just uh, share live stream link. Uh oh. internet can make fun of me as I screw this up. All right. So I think it would behoove me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, I forgot what I was doing there for a second. Oh dear, dear, dear. Should have put that in something. Many of the little pieces have gotten stuck to the sticky tape <laughs> that's uh, used to close this envelope. I hope there are a few extras. <laughs> I, uh, none of them went on the floor, as far as I can tell, despite foolishly not opening this into a a bin because I'm, I'm too lazy to simply reach up a few inches above my head and grab a bin. But I think that's everything. Okay. <laughs> so, you know what? I better do that. So let's, um, let's do this. That's too big though. Um, let me get a smaller bin on the other side of the room. Just, just saw that somewhere. Hmm. Where did I have that little, little white bin? So frustrating. Um, okay. I don't want this to be a video of me searching for a bin, so I'm going to just make do with what I've got. Uh, that is weird. I have so many little bits. Oh, you know, most of them are out in the garage. I think, I think last time I did this, those actually came in super handy. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, this will take me about a minute and a half, but I'm going to run out and I've got some little bins in another room. Let's see if the wireless mic holds up. There we go. That's going to make life a lot easier if I can sort some of these things. All right. Haven't looked at the instructions yet, but I'm still laboring under the assumption that uh, I'm going to want to have these all sorted anyway. <laughs> so this is, I know, super exciting. Um, but what can you say? I think I can set the zip ties aside. Later on, when I say, what happened to those zip ties? That's where I put them. Um, there's the keys. I guess I can start putting the LEDs in there. This is one of those jobs where I think 
being on some sort of recreational stimulant would probably be helpful. Okay, there's some knobs. Let's set that aside. Uh -huh. Little standoffs. You go there. You go there. This might take a little while. Whoops. <laughs> I said I would do the whole thing, and I'm doing the whole thing. Da, da, da. <laughs> so much soldering. <laughs> um, hmm. Diodes. See, it would be cool if that tray were a slightly different size, but I'll put the diodes in the orange one. Different things. Sure. Sure. Uh -huh. For those who have just tuned in, this is a three-hour program called Chris Sorts Components into Bins. Prior preparation, per French, per 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 per. That's what they say. Uh, about like halfway done. This is probably, you know, halfway done with the whole project. There are probably people like those, people who watch those asthma videos, you know, there are probably people who watch component sorting videos find them soothing. This would make me want to claw my eyes out. It's very frustrating to watch people do certain things, I've found. Uh, walking down stairs in front of me, that's one of them. Uh, being Generally being in front of me when I'm trying to go somewhere find that very unpleasant to watch. Okay, getting there, getting there. If I got all the LEDs out of the way first, hello. It's gonna be fun when I knock that over. Uh, different size screw. Easier to get all these little plastic standoffs or sleeves or whatever they are. Uh, all right, we got, is that little screw, little screw? Uh, some nuts. Uh, all right, little plastic guys, another nut, little plastic guy, another standoff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Put the resistors in with the diodes. It'll be the end of the world. They're probably different values, but I'll deal with that later. Different nuts. I forget what it was that I was putting together where they had stuff like these little plastic things and they were, they came in like six different sizes and they were all a millimeter different. So you just, why? Why can't you design something to use the same part? I've used almost all my bins, okay. Get the resistors here in that bin. Look, it's almost done. The little screw. That. That leaves a bunch of, no, oh, still another resistor. A bunch of diodes. Oh. See my ESD protection? Isn't it glorious? Okay. Ha ha! That is. That is some prep work done. I do say so myself. Now, now I suppose I should look at the instructions. So, oh look, there's a, there's comments on the chat. What is it I'm making? I'm, I'm building PyDP11 kit. That is correct. I am. It's in the description. There's a link. 
this thing. So uh, just cleaning up my workspace here a little so I don't get uh, don't knock everything over. I actually have a little table I'm going to drag over here. Apologies once again for the nothing happening portion of this stream. Uh-oh. Uh I picked up the table from the part that falls off if you pick it up. <laughs> oh, I wish I had this on video. It's pretty funny. Um, okay. Almost back. There we go. I've reassembled the table that I broke in every possible way uh, while moving it over here. So I'm going to, uh, apologies, just the little microphone, put all my parts out of the way, minimize the possibility of dumping them out. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's peruse the instructions together. Um, I have not read them yet, so this will, be, this will be new for me. Although it's probably very similar to the PyDP8 uh, that I put together before. So, uh, build the kit. If you don't, I mean, this is, you can read this website, but this is a, uh, it's basically a, a um, sorry, what would you call it? What do they call it? Modern replica. Yes, it's a replica. That's right. It has a Raspberry Pi inside of it, and then it's got a front panel with blinking lights and switches, and it runs a uh, an emulator simulator uh, of a PDP-11, and it is awesome. Swiss. All right. So all these pieces. Da da da. -da. Prepare your Pi. We're starting with software. Oh gracious. Is this going to be exciting? Or should I do the soldering first? I feel like I should do the soldering first. That's what, that's what everybody came here for. Promised I would do assembly. Um, I think I'm going to skip step one. And I am going to go straight on to step two. I suspect step one is used to test step two, maybe. But my plan uh, is to go back to step one if I have to. Uh, now we talk about solder, we talk about masking tape. Uh, note that the Pi GPIO connector goes on the back. So when it comes to this part here, I'm assuming that this is the front with the logo, component side, and this would be the back. So the GPIO connector here, presumably that means that goes on the back. Sorry, it's black on black here. Pi mounts on the back of the board. Et voila. So that makes sense to me. Always good to check your assumptions. I'm doing this relatively slowly because I do not want to screw it up. Start with the... Th <laughs> 30 diodes. <laughs> I just want to cry. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 30 diodes. Um, 30 diodes agree. Honesty is the best policy. Here we go, kids. Um, yeah. Um, sure. So... Let's get our let's get our station set up. I don't know exactly what I'm gonna. There's my bucket of diodes. Let's see where they go. So diodes above the switches. So there's a row here of diodes above the switches, and they are labeled for polarity. So the black stripe on the diode. That's probably not gonna come out on there. Black stripe to my left. That come out black stripe matches with the stripe on the bottom here. And yeah, that's going to be, I think I'm just going to do this right here on the, uh, 
on the table. Um, you know, it might help slightly just for the camera, being very careful not to knock bowls of parts over. But sometimes when I'm doing these, I put this thing here because it's. <laughs> I just almost knocked that over because <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it's not so shiny and uh, it doesn't blow out the camera like that. So I'm st I've stalled as much as humanly possible. Uh, let's get the uh, soldering iron. My beloved Hacko FX 951. Sorry for the noise, but this project is going to demand fume extraction. And it's going to demand a little more light for me. <sighs> what else? What else could I possibly want? Nothing. Okay, man. Turn that on. Cardboard box, <laughs> put on the jams. Yeah, if I, if I put anything on, then, then I'll get YouTube copyright striked. Uh, I have, oh, you know what helped, I think with the, with the PyDP8 is my component lead benders. Probably the smallest one. So let's spend a lot of time sticking things in the holes. Just see how it fits. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, it's a good idea. Put put this on something. Um, be some public domain music I could play but uh, but I'm not going to I'm just gonna sit here taking up megabits of bandwidth per second bending leads shoving things in holes So, what's up, internet? <laughs> How many of these are out there? I admit I've been a terrible fan, and I am a fan, but I just don't have a lot of spare cycles, so I haven't really been following the, uh, the forum. I haven't been keeping up. Too many, too many different hobbies and distractions. I should have had a assembly party or something and had people come over and you know they could help bend the leads or something. <laughs> Save me. Oh, you can't see any of this. I hate when people do that. Not that it matters. What are you going to see? But what's the whole point of doing this on video if I'm not actually in the frame of view of the camera? I'm already really tired. <laughs> I haven't started. Um, I enjoy this, though. It's kind of... Enjoyably mindless. Ah, can't hold that. 
put these in at the same time. Ah, geez, ah. Yeah. I will inevitably put one in upside down. I don't think I've done so yet. But to sort of bug my sense of, of neatness, as I'm, I'm trying to go as fast as I can here, and I've, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I'm not bending these consistently, so they are, some of them are slightly higher than others. So they, rather than form a beautiful neat line, they're slightly, slightly offset. Oh well. As someone once said to me, let that be your biggest problem. Except she said it. Something like, let that be your biggest problem. She was selling me a box of gift basket of uh, fruit and nuts. Tavlin Market in Belmore, New York. Why do I remember that? I don't know. Okay, I've put a few of these in the holes. Now, a, sa a sensible person maybe would stop at this point, and maybe solder, solder the first bunch. Maybe they'd do that just to break up the monotony a little bit. Now, I think, I think Oscar, I think that's his name, the guy behind this thing, he's a, he's a big fan of, of putting tape on this, I think, if I remember back to the... PyDP8 days, because otherwise I'm going to turn this over and they're all going to fall, fall out. That's the worry. But it didn't happen. I got away with it. I will lower my chair. I will engage this light, which causes a tremendous uh, glare, but sorry. Um, and I will engage my fume extractor. And I'll be back. Oh, I gotta put on. I'm gonna put on the Lewis Rossman black nitrile gloves. If you're going to sock, you should always wear the Lewis Rossman black nitrile gloves. But see, he's got small hands, I think. Even the extra large size of these gloves is not it's not as nice as the uh, microflex safe grip blue gloves that I prefer to wear but you know when you're making a fashion statement like I am come on there we go ta-da all right so uh, here's my Older. Here's my fume extractor. There's a try and make me nuts here with the black solder mask. Beep. Beep. I have my head in the shot. I'm looking over at the screen. the good solder. Just a, what is it? Kester. Not that one. Just got a little distracted by a shadow there and I think I soldered a hole shut that I need to 
stick a resistor in later. Is that off screen? It's probably off screen. No, it's not. Skipped over the hole this time. It's not my best work, but I blame the solder mask. Check and make sure these are relatively flat. Yep. Now we will go in with my favorite. The Knipex. 78, 81, 125. Good tools. Oh. That's like half. Not too bad. Be almost done. Can I install Unix yet? a little bit there for somebody to there we go come on okay uh, a small fraction of the diodes has been installed I do need to get that hole cleaned up there I think I will use the fabulous Japanese solder sucker, the engineer brand. It's not going to focus on that. The SSO2. Um, these things normally don't work and no, nobody likes them, but uh, in this case, this one does, and it's probably the most expedient way to clean that hole out. Yes, done. Okay, now we will just return to the next step in the assembly line. Glance over at the screen. Anyone foolish enough to have joined this stream has now given up. Okay. Get my, where did I put my little box? There it is.
back to putting the rest of the diodes in the holes. Yeah, maybe it'll be diodes tonight, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. This is actually one of the more useful 3D printed objects I have 3D printed, the uh, component lead bender, although honestly I've uh, never used anything but the smallest uh, end of it, so probably could just have <laughs> used any old piece of plastic. Uh, beverage, but not while I'm soldering. I would not win any awards for production speed here. I think I'm perfectly capable of going faster, but um, but I choose not to. Uh -huh. Come on, come on, come on! I do kind of want to get to the switches because I think the switches is is the fun part. Five more. Five more in this section, and then I guess there are some others. But I'm going to finish this section. And then come up for air. Speaking of coming up for air, I should really turn my HEPA filter back on. I turned it off earlier because I was like, I'm going to do this thing. I don't want to, come on. I don't want to have all this noise, which is a pretty stupid thing to, to say because one, you won't hear it over there on low. And two, I'm turning on the fume extractor anyway. Okay, where was I? And I can see over in the corner of my eye that my uh, FUBOT air quality meter is orange, which certainly happens when I solder with poor ventilation. more in here and then we can solder the next batch and then do whatever comes after that. I guess I should talk about politics or something while I do this. I can talk about how evil Facebook is. 
apple. Okay, let's put these back in the bin. Okie dokie. Bin out of the way. Check all these again, just to make sure that I haven't put any of them in upside down. They look okay. I think they're stuck in there enough that I can turn this over. Nothing falls out. Yay. Fume extractor. Ready to go. How are we doing here on the live stream? Still? <laughs> I went over a bunch of shows. I have... I have never seen those shows. I've seen clips from American Idol. But I'm not into that kind of reality TV. This is reality. All right. Try a different approach this time so that I don't smoke myself out. Gonna get the back side. Which requires a bit of hangulation. Stopped. It's reasonably satisfying. Nice part is that occasionally you get it, you know, you do one perfect. That's very satisfying. Never had that. inspection good enough good enough for a bunch of diodes diodes get that light out of my face and see if we can speed up the process a little bit here.
cool. Let's check that out, see how I did. Yeah, pretty lousy job. There we go, slightly better. Fine, nobody's going to be rubbing the back of this board. Um, now, we have to do six diodes around the rotary switches and one diode to the left of the IC socket. So, six diodes around the rotary switches. I see rotary switches over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. The problem with this chipboard is that it gets all over everything. Don't use that on anything black and shiny. Okay, this should be relatively straightforward. Hadn't had enough of this yet. We're gonna do a few more. <laughs> And then the LEDs next, so it's like you don't get to the cool switch part till later. I'm going to bend these leads first. Let's try that. Let's see if it's like assembly line fashion. Then I'm not trying to hold this lead forming tool while I'm inserting them into the holes, which was definitely an issue I was having. Also, these gloves are not pleasant. My hands are all sweaty. Okay. There we go. There's six and six. I should do one more. Alrighty, so there's the IC socket, and there's the one to the left of the IC socket. Let's put that in there. And then, and then, these go here. Three D printer. My three D printer is a Lulzbot Mini. I am a big fan of Lulzbot at least a couple of years ago when I got mine. Uh, I was very impressed by how Lulzbot products work out of the box. My experience up till then with other people's 3D printers had been that it was a kind of a hobby thing in the way that some people, is the metaphor that I use, or as an analogy or simile, some people um, buy motorcycles because they like to ride motorcycles. Some people buy motorcycles because they like to take their motorcycle apart and fix it every weekend. And the 3D printers were much akin to the latter in that you spent most of your time with a 3D printer fixing and upgrading it and not actually making stuff, but I was very impressed with the Lulzbot because he took it out of the box and within uh, a couple of minutes, you could be printing something. And my experience was that it worked the first time and worked every time thereafter. Uh, and with the exception of some minor repairs, because it still is kind of a hobby thing, uh, I have had tremendous success with my Lulzbot. Now, I think the Prusa is, uh, you know, the other, one of the other few other brands that has a similar reputation. Um, and I'm, you know, obviously I enjoy doing hobby type of stuff, but I only have so much time for hobbies. So like, you know, 
I don't want to be building my own 3D printer out of parts, nor do I want to pay for the privilege of owning one that's essentially equivalent to building it out of parts. If I'm going to buy one, I want to buy one that I can use to make stuff. So the only downside to the Mini is that it is a Mini, six inches in all three dimensions is the biggest you can go, uh, which has constrained my ability to print very few things, but a few things where I've either had to make it in parts and then sort of glue them together or use someone else's printer in the maker space or something. I thought about getting a TAS 6. They are quite expensive. And I think they just came out with a new industrial quality one, uh, which is interesting. I haven't looked into it much, though. Partly because I have the Mini in a nice enclosure down here. I'm very, very happy with my little lab slash maker space in the basement. And the Mini is set up really nicely. Uh, and there's simply not room for a larger printer. As much as I could use a larger printer uh, on occasion to make stuff, I'd have to rearrange the furniture yet again. And between the um, the X-Carve and the Glowforge and so on, there's some, some large stuff here that I really just can't uh, keep taking up more and more space in what I thought was a big room when we bought the house. Uh, okay, this should be the last of the diodes. Yeah, I would definitely look at a Prusa if I were to get another machine. Um, the, especially since, I think I saw at the last Maker Faire, well, I didn't see because they were so crowded, <laughs> almost nobody got to see, but I, I vaguely recall an announcement. Um, they were talking about some of their new new models or new products or whatever, and they seem to put so much effort into um, trying to, you know, basically do that fit and finish thing at the end, you know, of uh, like detecting the the, the filament uh, running out and uh, you know on the fly analysis of like the diameter and stuff. So like they're yeah they're clearly um, just some convenience features. Yeah. You you know you can you can hack these filaments out sensors onto your existing printer, but um, it's nice that the manufacturers, including a three cent part like that. Um, anyway, I'm babbling. Okay, so I think I have all of the diodes in. So let's see what's next. Um, six one K resistors. Oh boy. Say, oh boy, just because that's boring. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's how it goes. Okay. 61K resistors and the block of 12 390 ohm resistors. So we have... These guys... Those are the 390s, and these are the brown, black, red. 1K. That won't, I don't think that's an autofocus. Anyway, trust me. Trust me. These all appear to be the same, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Seems about right. Always include a spare. So this will be just like the last part. Let's zoom in here. Can't. Trying to keep some windows open so I can monitor this thing. Okay, let's uh, let's see where these go now. Six one K resistors, I guess they're one two. Three. Uh, makes sense that they would be four, five, six. Okay. Cool. Let's 
Check the lead spacing on these. Looks like it's slightly wider, but the last one was kind of iffy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Does everybody else uh, have to have the color bands going in the same direction? I just drives me nuts to look at something where they're just placed in random positions. Random. Ooh. Not good. That'll be my spare. Yeah, so this is this is what I find always to be the case with this. That there's all these different widths, but I actually have to go up here on the very top. I should make another one of these that is more useful for the real world. I think this was actually I have them right here. There was all there was a set uh, thing of This is probably one of the first things I printed. Um, all of them are way too big. All right, since I've decided to put the brown on top, I'm going to put the brown on top for all three of these. Because I'm not a terrible person. Okay. But you, you, you realize what's coming next, right? I am going to waffle about so these, these are positioned vertically, these three, and the three over there are positioned horizontally. So if the, brown, if the brown is on the top, on the vertical ones, then which side does it have to go on on the horizontal ones? Hmm. That's the kind of thing that'll keep you up at night. I'm going to solder these first because they're in a different place on the board than the other ones. Yes, it does. I agree with you, Bod Chal. It does make it easy when you're trying to read them and they're all in different, different orientations. I mean, I realize that I don't know how many of these types of situations are you know, stuffed by human beings, but if you're making your own, if you're crying out loud, do it right. There. It's feeling better now. I kind of like when you make pancakes. The first couple never come out right. say see I could there's there are two I think there are two arguments that I could make here one would be that the I could orient it toward the writing right so it says it says 1k going from bottom to top 1k reading that way so if it reads 1k that way and in that sense the gold is at the beginning of the 1k and then over here it says 1k going left to right so naturally you'd want to rotate the resistor this way so that the gold is still, you know, still the same way. In fact, I think that's the only way that makes sense. Um, what was I thinking that there could even be any sort of controversy over that? Anyone who does anything else than that is just out of their gourd. Follow the silk screen. Now you could make the argument that, that when Oscar designed this board, I mean, obviously it should read left to right 1K, but should it read top to bottom 1K? I don't know. I'd have to think about that and I don't want to think about it because if I think about it and I decide that it's wrong, then, uh, you know, I don't know. It's something I have to 
block out of my consciousness. Okay, it's kind of like naming variables. It's never, nothing's really right. You just have to convince yourself that it's okay enough that you can let it go. Three more, and then we'll be done with, <laughs> no, we won't be done with the resistors. We'll be done with the 1K resistors. And if you thought six resistors was exciting. Next, we'll be doing 12. Can't see a gold dang thing. How far do I have to lean before my head is in the shot? Yeah. Um, oh, that's terrible. Terrible job. But it'll work. Inspect, inspect, reject. Yeah, whatever. This is not a fussy part. Going anywhere. My father always called me to help him with stuff when I was a kid. He would be doing things around the house. You know, he's like, You have young eyes. You can get that screw into the hole or whatever. It's one of those weird, you know, you don't really understand what that means you know, when you're 12, you have young eyes. Can't everybody always see this well? Okay, so that's, that's the 1K resistors. Well, did we lose the connection? We lost the connection. Let's see what's going on here. I don't know. YouTube seems happy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. It's, it's, it's working here when I join it. Uh, okay. Um, next. Next, these puppies. So, just like before, I want to start by just taking a gander at the board and understanding where these go. Pretty obvious, there are big blocks of 390s here. It'd be nice if that would focus, but I could put it under the microscope. Uh, Four, eight, twelve. Twelve, that's how many I was looking for more. <laughs> so they all go right there in the middle of the board. <sighs> Easy enough. Um, okay, let me do my thing. Could have just pulled the tape off when you're uh, using a solderless breadboard. They recommend that you don't just pull the tape off because then you've got tape on the ends. It doesn't make good contact, but I'm not using a solderless breadboard here, so why am I doing this the hard way? 
I would say instill good habits. Okay. Many of these, do I, I think I counted before that I had 13 or something like that. I will do them in groups of four, because they're in groups of four on the board. Yes, four groups of four, and then, and then the giant drawer full of them that I have. I have components. I think what I might do is I might get, I might do the, well, I keep saying that like I'm going to stop. <laughs> this is, it's very hard to stop a project like this. I think when I put my X-Carve together, I think I have an X-Carve assembly video somewhere on my channel. Um, if I didn't, I should have. I saw, I saw other people were getting those at the time. The Inventables did a really good job of marketing that thing by sending it to a lot of YouTubers for free. I'm not one of those people, but um, they got me because I decided I wanted one. And I saw a lot of videos where people were putting them together over two or three days. Um, and I just, I just put mine together in one go. I couldn't, couldn't really stop. I wanted it done. But I think it was, it was like overnight. <laughs> it was up up all night assembling it. Uh, I can't afford that here because I have to go to work tomorrow. It's 9.45 Eastern Daylight Time. Okay. Now, I have to be consistent here. So that's actually... This is, this is going to bug me now because nobody called me out on this. There's like three or four people watching, but <clears throat> realistically, now this reads left to right, gold, red, black, brown. I mean, what, what kind of an idiot would do that? <sighs> really feel like I need to start over. I'm just kidding. So we're going to do... Oh, these are those wacky high tolerance ones, high precision, whatever. We'll put the orange on the left. Ah, but then if I do that, uh, do it this way. Ah, I'm gonna hate myself now. What was I thinking? the tolerance band on the left. Oh. Don't look at me, I'm hideous. There's some kind of, um, there's, there's like a bunch of uh, resistor color code at apps. I don't know if you call them apps uh, on the Google Assistant. And uh, the, it's like super convenient because you can just ask, but you have to remember the magic words. And then some of them don't work very well. But if you, I, can't remember the right ones. Let me. I'm gonna try this one. I don't know if we can hear this. As soon as I get that in the hole. Hey Google, ask resistor decoder brown, black, red. Sorry, I'm not sure how to help with that. Sorry, I'm not sure how to help with that. Hey Google, talk to resistor decoder. 
think that's even right. Okay, let's get resistor decoder. So. Hi, I can help you decipher what value a resistor truly has. Just tell me its color code. You can also ask for help. Brown, black, red. Resistors must have above four color <laughs> Do you want to try again? <laughs> Brown, black, red, gold. Probably wants a yes or no answer. Your resistor has a value of one kilo ohm with a tolerance of five percent. Yeah. Do you want to try again? No. I'm happy I could help. So what, I suppose you have it backwards. Hey Google, talk to resistor decoder. I think you get it in one shot. You want to know the value of a resistor? Just ask me. Gold, red, black, brown. The color gold is not allowed for the first two bands. <laughs> well, you want to try again? No, no. Right, it's not allowed for the first two bands, so why don't you assume that I... Resistor guide you to glory. <laughs> There's one, though, where you can set... You can just say it all in one go. You can be like, ask resistor decoder blot, and it'll just, it'll just tell you. Anyway. That killed a few moments. I don't know, that probably didn't come out on my microphone anyway. But it didn't understand when I asked it in one go. And then it's like, just tell me the colors. And I said, brown, black, red. And it says, you must, you must have at least four colors. Uh-huh. So it's not, it's not practical. It's just, it's almost like somebody did that as a demonstration. Um, I do like the idea of doing this a little higher, though. It's uh, um, yeah. so I should listen to people. <clears throat> give me advice instead of having to independently discover the advice myself. Okay. Um, yeah. It's just not super flat, though. Fine. Whatever. Fine, whatever. Okay, here we go. Am I still here? I'm still here. Getting a little... Getting slower. That's that's the problem. I I, know, I learned that a long time ago. I had this job where I was writing Java code. I hate Java, but I had to do Java. It was the first kind of I don't know. It's a grown-up company, but it was like a you know, New York City startup, and. Uh, I was just struggling with some problem. I remember struggling with this problem. This is how I remember the story anyway. It's probably not true. But uh, I was working till some ridiculous hour of the night, midnight, in this office in uh, midtown Manhattan. And um, when I finally gave up, as I recall, I didn't actually solve the problem. It's one of, one of these things where I just didn't want to let go, kind of like putting together this board. And um, eventually, when I realized I, I just it was too late, I couldn't see anymore, I couldn't get the thing to work, I gave up. And I trudged back to Penn Station. And I got to Penn Station, and I'm standing there on the platform, you know, 12.30 a.m., waiting for my train. This was, I think, a Friday night. And then all of a sudden, all of these people start emerging from the tunnel, from the, from the stairwells from underground. They just, they, they show up, and they fill the hall. And they're all 20-somethings, maybe, teenagers, dressed up and they all look kind of you know they've got on their finest 
and they're like, what the heck is going on here? It's 12.30 in the morning. Where, where did these people come from? What, what's going on? And then I realized, after I kind of, I looked at them more closely and I paid attention, they were showing up from Long Island. They, they were coming into the city to go out. So I'm on my way home from my Java job. And, uh, and here's all these people who are just starting their evening, their Friday evening. And that's not really the story, but I just thought, I thought that was... I realized that I'm a very different lifestyle than these people. But the story is, I came in Monday morning and I immediately knew how to solve the problem that I had stayed at work till midnight on Friday working on. I looked at it and I was like, yeah, of course. And then, not only that, but I think half the code I had written on Friday, I had to throw away because it was bad. So... I mean, maybe other people are immune to this effect, but I don't think so from, <laughs> from talking to other people. We've all experienced this. You get slower and dumber the longer you bash your head against a problem. It does not make sense. Go home, rest, come back, or you'll find yourself redoing all your work anyway. say this applies to 996, but I think that the kind of work that they're getting out of people at Alibaba is probably not the kind of work that requires a lot of careful thinking. but I will gladly criticize Gary Vaynerchuk or his ilk for talking about hustle in similar terms. Now I know I lost one, there it is. That having been said, of course, there are times when you just, you know, you're having fun and you want to plow through, like right now. It's 10 o'clock at night. I've got the diodes in. I've got all the resistors in. Let's take a look here. Um, time to put the GPIO connector on the back. Hmm. And the socket. I might as well do at least those. I hope there's a nice pot of tea waiting for me upstairs. I'm kind of a lazy person. I think, you know, uh, also a Perl programmer, which, I mean, I don't write, don't get an opportunity to write any Perl anymore, but I have been, you know, it's, I am by nature a Perl programmer. Larry Wall who wrote that the virtues of a programmer are laziness and patience and hubris. And in particular, I think the laziness and patience can come in handy because that's the kind of thing that can lead you to uh, creative solutions. You know, 
how do you get that socket lined up? Just like I did, you know. Solder it in crooked and then push on the back while you reheat the solder. I really like doing connectors like this because this is one where you can, you know, there's no leads in the way. And you can just, you can just get into the zone. One of the best things I ever bought myself was this solder uh, spool. And a couple big rolls of, <coughs> I don't remember the number, Kester, I'm gonna say something like 66, I don't know. There's some number on it. This glorious solder. Owe it to yourself to buy high quality leaded solder. But I bought this cheap Chinese brass wool for my, to replace the one that came with my soldering iron. <coughs> you know, when you get a pack of like 10 of them for a dollar, there's something going on. And what I'm discovering is this shit unravels. I like the sponge, I like this stuff. Big fan. It kind of unravels. I have opinions about tools. <coughs> Excuse me. Probably do almost enough of this that I that I should consider uh, buying a better fuel extractor. But again, that that one just that one fits right there. This is this is the stuff. This is the one. says uh, 6337. So this is this is number 66 slash 44. So I was right. It's the Kester 66. It's 63% uh, sn and 37% pub. It's my favorite. Okay. Really getting, I'm getting distracted. All right, I put the GPO connector on the back. Now I need to put the chip socket on the front. Chip socket, chip socket, hot pockets. Felt like there was more than one chip socket, but there isn't more than one chip socket. There's chips. The Max 232s go there, but this one, for whatever reason, is socketed. Hmm. This would be a fun, this is a fun little exercise. 
for various reasons. All will be revealed. Remember Lost? They told you every week, next week, all will be revealed. They never revealed shit. I hated those guys. It was all like, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's life. It's a mystery, and that's part of why it's so much fun. We don't give you all the answers. You'd hate it if we gave you all the answers. So one of the things, <laughs> trap for young players, as Dave Jones says, if you do the trick of soldering one pin like this, connector, you can solder one pin, and then you can put your thumb on the back and get it all lined up. Well, you melt that and then push it, and you know. If you try to do that with one of these chip sockets, which I learned <laughs> the hard way, the, the metal part here is, is connected to the, these pins, so you'll burn your frickin' finger. Um, so I will push the edges that are not part of that pin. There we go. Laziness. Let's make sure the other side is good, too. That's why I did the middle rather than the, the uh, ends, because so I can put my fingers on the outside, and instead of putting it there, where the heat's going to come right through, I can push it there. It's like kindergarten soldering tips that everybody already knows. But I'm desperate to say something. Finish this in complete silence. Okay. Do I have any more stories? Not really. I have a PDP-11 somewhere. I'm not sure which one it is. I say 1170, but I, I don't, that doesn't sound right. I mean, it sounds exactly right, but the reason it doesn't sound right is because it sounds too right. When I was in college, there was a place, they had like an incubator on campus, which I think means a, a tech park where small companies can get some kind of assistance from the college. To start their businesses and, and fail. Did I put that socket on upside down? I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> Put the socket on upside down. Well, that's okay. What is this? What is this precious little guy? TBD62783APG. That would be a cool Google skill, would be like to be able to ask what a chip is. I'm gonna put the chip in now. I hope it's not like super sensitive or something, but I'm gonna put this in now because the, um, that way I won't have to remember later. <laughs> I put the socket on upside down. I, I could. I guess it might be somebody's definition of fun to take that out and uh, put it back in the right way. But I mean, you can see you can see the silk screen very clearly. So um, I have one of those guns, like the uh, the removal guns, and it's perfect for the, this kind of through hole. It would job. It would take two minutes. 
but then I have to put it back. Uh, I'd rather put this, I'd rather just put this in now and then take the chance. Okay. Fine. That was stupid. That was stupid. Okay, so we've got, so far to recap, we've got the diodes, we've got the all the resistors, we've got um, the Pi connector, we've got the chip socket. That's it. Now next, next would be the LEDs, and this, this would be an undertaking. Right next come the 64 LEDs. Polarity matters, long leg to the left. See the little drawing above the par high LED to show you how all LEDs must be inserted. The LEDs need to be pushed onto the provided 64 LED spacers. So they come out a bit higher on the PCB. Put LEDs plus spacers into the PCB. Once all are inserted, not soldered yet, push the LED cover on top of them with a small amount of force. The top one millimeter or so of each LED will peek out of the cover. Make sure by looking from a side that all of them are like that. Push around them to make sure they sit equally high. Now flip around the PCB, check if their long legs are all on the correct side, and solder up all LEDs. That would be 128 solder joints. One pin per LED first, then check they sit flush and solder up the other pin. You can move the LED cover to fix any problems and reseat it. The LED cover is intended to be on the LEDs permanently when you're finished. LED spacers are actually a great help when putting in LEDs, when you know how to use them. See the pictures below. The solid end of the spacer goes onto the PCB. The hollow end faces the LED. Put the LED into the spacer with its pins only protruding a bit. Now mount the LED plus spacer onto the PCB. Once the LED is in, press it all in all the way. A satisfying click and the LED is solidly in the right place. But best press the LED with two fingers, not one. Golly gee, that's a lot of words. So <laughs> can, can I now accomplish what has been described? Uh, let's, uh, let's just conceptualize here uh, there's there's an LED and here is a spacer mm, I'm gonna spend half the night digging the spacers out now oh that's cool so there's no way you can see this but the spacer is actually not just a little tube like I thought it might be that one end of the tube has two little holes in it for the LED and the other end is open so I think what he's saying here is the solid end of the spacer goes on the PCB, the hollow end faces the LED. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, so I would, have, I would have assumed it goes the other way, but I would have been wrong. Um, so let me try sticking one of these through the spacer like that. Interesting. And then... Um, now, that, I guess that explains what the other piece was that I was wondering about earlier with all the holes in it. That would be the LED, what do you call it? Hi, Bob Flanders. Um, that would be the cover. Seems to be the word, cover. So let's take a look here and figure out the geometry of this sucker so this goes like that clearly because there's a block of four eight there and then four down here so that goes with this whole pattern so this cover is going to go like that okay that makes sense and then um, there's supposed to be a picture here uh, there's a picture there all LEDs showing the long leg on the left. And you can see how dusty this freaking thing gets from this chipboard I put down to prevent glare. It's doing a fantastic job, too. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, satisfying click. Where's the satisfying click? I was promised a satisfying click. Once the LED is in, 
press it in all the way. Oh. Is that what he, oh, I see. I would call this satisfying click. Two fingers, huh? I don't know, man. You got me wondering. <laughs> you really got, what, what produces a click? This is a really, this is wobbly. I don't know. That's supposed to stay? I don't know, man. Pretty sure, though, I got the, got the right end in. I think, I think I'm going to click. <laughs> There's no click, man. <laughs> um, I think in lieu of a click, uh, oh, I got stuck on there. In lieu of a click, I'm going to depend on this cover to uh, hangulate everything correctly. I guess I don't know. This is gonna take. This is gonna take ages just to stick these. Yeah. I'm going to um, dig a few out. Let's let's see how long this takes per LED. So I gotta feed that in through the holes, and then keeping the long leg on the left, stick it into these holes. Oh God, there's no satisfying click. Quite confused about that concept. Also, it's, is it something about top one millimeter of each LED will peek out the cover? I was getting a lot more than one millimeter. Sometimes, the, this is what happens too, is when you get, this is inevitable with any sort of project this big, um, you just get to a point where some part of the instructions don't make sense to you. And, uh, and it, it can be, uh, It'd be a tough one because the fear is that I, you know, you do something wrong. Okay. Anyway, I don't think it's I don't think it's wrong to mount all these LEDs onto the board. It might be wrong to stay up and solder them all because it's now quarter after ten. Did I put that the right way? Yes, I did. I'm going to start second guessing. Okay. Should not have put these little spacers into that tiny compartment on my tray. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be digging them out. There's a picture. Yeah, there is a picture. I got the picture right here. Um, that's fine. It's fine. I don't. I don't understand what would produce a satisfying click. I think maybe is there's that weird little sort of flat spot on the legs. Maybe that going through the hole was meant to produce the click. I don't know. Who needs a click when you've got six internet friends? I assume you're all my internet friends now. We've been through so much together. And I'm really, every time I do one of these now, I can't remember, did I actually pay attention to the orientation? Did I, did I? I think if I remember correctly, I didn't screw anything up on the PyDP8. I'm going to give myself that credit, whether it's true or not. Uh, I had one bad switch, though, which was interesting. You'd think out of all the parts that might be bad, it's not going to be the switch. And I don't remember the details, because it was a while ago. 
Uh, I do remember that I was able to work around it. Not by using a spare, because I didn't have one, but by reversing the switch. So it was like a three position switch or something. And the, uh, maybe I didn't, I didn't need one of the, it, wh whichever way it didn't work, I didn't need that way. Or the way it came, it didn't work, but I was able to flip it around and arrange for the broken, broken position to be the unused position. This is how much sense I make at 10.30 at night after I've been staring at all these components. And I'm now dropping things on the floor. Uh, da, da, da. <laughs> There's so many left to do. <laughs> I look up like it's going to be half done. <sighs> this is going to be so cool when it's done. Though. I... When, when this box arrived, I got home from work and I saw this box and I was like, oh, after dinner, I'll put this together and then I'll bring it to work tomorrow. And, and I'll, show the, I'll show the cool kids. You know who I have breakfast with? A bunch of Bell Labs people. Depending on the day, Sometimes that includes Peter Weinberger. Switches are the killers, yeah. I see there's some mechanism for lining up the switches. Da -da -da. And on special occasions, Brian Kernighan himself comes into the office and sits at our breakfast table. Uh, let's see. It would be really cool to have this next time he shows up. So tired. I am going to VCF East, yes. I'm looking forward to it. Keep wishing that someone will sell me a teletype. Ever since I put that Pidey P8 together, I want like a genuine ASR33, is that, the, is that what it's called? Genuine teletype. And I just don't think I have the wherewithal to buy 30 broken ones from eBay and piece them together into one working Franken teletype. I just want to walk into a room and have somebody has one that says, for sale, at a price you can afford, working. Oh, they're gonna be there? Cool. That is cool. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm just blown away sometimes when I think about my, my heroes. I've met so many of my heroes. Who would have thought those many years ago when I picked up a copy of the C programming language, I had this job actually my my first job my after school job 
did not have the useful formative experience of working in food service, which would have been a good thing. I think I could have learned some some good uh, work ethic and proper hatred of the customer if I had actually worked at McDonald's or something, but I guess I kind of lucked out and stumbled into this job working for a uh, sort of, I guess what you would call now big data. <laughs> um, but at the time, uh, their big data processes ran on state-of-the-art 286s running DOS, and most of their stuff was written in BASIC. They had a compiler. It was, it was Microsoft Quick Basic, and I forget what the compiler was. I feel like it was a, hmm, was that a Watcom product? Anyway, they had this thing that made BASIC programs run really fast. And Spitball, that was the other programming language that was, the owner was particularly fond of, of Spitball, which is a PC. Wayne can get you a good 33 ASR. Oh, cool. I, I need to get in touch with Wayne then because I'm, I'm willing to pay market rate. I just, uh, I just can't fix one up. So yeah, Spitball was a PC version of Snowball, I believe. Which is an interesting programming language. I think the distinguishing feature is for every line of code, there are two go-tos. So take that structured programming. Uh, and pattern matching. So anyway, this place was in the woods of upstate New York in Hageman and uh, literally ran out of a barn. This guy Ray owned the place and I would go there on Saturdays. I'd go there after school and I would initially, I think he hired me as just to, you know, do some kind of menial work, you know, expecting what does this kid know about anything? So pass and fail. Yes, exactly right, Bob Flanders. Snowball, yeah. So I don't remember that much about the syntax, but something, and I think like you wrote colon something at the end, you basically wrote the line where line to go to if if it succeeded and the line to go to if it failed. Um, weird structure. But, you know, because of the pattern matching at the time, the guy really liked it. It was really good for the kind of data stuff that they did. Um, a lot of, like, warranty claim processing for car companies and stuff. So, uh, considering the time, they, they were actually really state-of-the-art. You know, the Ford would send them all of their warranty claim data on these, you know, mainframe tapes. They had a bunch of different kinds of tape drives there and they could read the files. Uh, and then they would process them and they would like send back a file of the ones they thought were most likely to be fraudulent or something like that. Machine learning, you call it now. And so I started working at this place and the guy had me uh, inventorying tapes. You know, I had all these tapes that were not labeled. And so he showed me how to put the how to put the nine track tape into this machine and press the button and load it and then get a directory and figure out what was on it and then make a label and <laughs> stick the label on and put the tape away. Um, and this process took a while, right? So I'm sitting there waiting for the waiting for these tapes to uh, read. And while I'm waiting, there was like a room, like a little room in a in a barn. And they had maybe eight computers, or ten computers or something. Again, two eighty six PCs. They were all they were all networked using the state of the art LANtastic, which is a peer to peer uh, file sharing thing. So from any computer you could basically share your 
C drive with another computer and then go mount on another one. It was actually not a bad idea for the time. And they were all connected via 10 base 2 coax with T's and terminators. So every once in a while, one of them would fall out or somebody would trip over it or run over it with a vacuum cleaner. But, um, yeah, I had hours and hours to kill while I'm waiting for these tapes to load, so I went. I would go over to one of the spare computers that nobody's using because it was a peer-to-peer -peer thing. Like, people could sit down at any machine, and they'd still have to sort of network mount their, you know, the computer that their data was actually on because, remember, these were the days before hard drives were not infinitely large. <laughs> right? So it was, there was a constant process of, like, I, I can't, I, in order to do today's work, first I have to zip the files uh, that I did from the last project in order to make some room on the drive and then copy them over the network to a different computer that has slightly more room on it and then maybe archive them to tape and then I have to unarchive some other file and then unzip it. Each one of these, like, you'd unzip a file and you'd have to wait two hours. Um, so there was a lot of downtime and it was DOS, no multitasking, so sat there and waited and he had magazines you know dr dobbs journal you could read and uh, so i'm sitting there and i just went over to a spare computer and i started uh just writing basic programs because i had my commodore 64 at home and i knew basic and i was like learned quick basic on the fly and he had a book on computer graphics and i i didn't understand any of the math but it, ga it gave the um it, it gave the um the, the, the math for doing uh, like affine transformations, you know, rotating things in 3D space. So I ended up writing this program, which, which you know, showed my name on the screen and, and uh, you know, like line drawing and rotated it around. And still to this day, like, I don't know how I managed to write that because I don't think I could do it now, but <laughs> I had this book in front of me and it did, it did explain uh, some of the math in a way that I was able to translate into my high school level so um and he and he, he saw he saw this thing the owner walked by he's like oh you can you can <laughs> you can program <laughs> i should put you to work writing code um so there still got a few more this story is almost taken up because i'm so tedious when i tell stories almost taken up all the time i need to put these leds in switches. Ah, okay. I'll definitely pay attention to that. I'm going to go read, I'm going to read the chat in a minute. I only got a few more of these to put in. Um, yeah, so I'm working at this place and doing all these operations that take, you know, they would, it was such a laid back environment. I loved it. It was, it gave me the idea of what, you know, what work is supposed to be like, right? <laughs> you'd come in in the morning, you'd type an unzip command and for the next two and a half hours, You'd sit there at the little picnic table he had set up and read a magazine. And uh, he had all these, he loved programming languages. He loved different languages. Um, this is the place where I wrote APL for money. Um, he, 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 had this, he had this APL, uh, again, for, for PC, and he loved it because it was one of the few things. This was, you know, extended and expanded memory on, on the PCs and this is one of the few things that could just take advantage of all the memory and make it seem flat and you could just like do giant matrix things. So he used it for that. But anyway, I keep getting distracted from wanting to get to this point. I had all this downtime and so I saw this copy uh, of uh, the C programming language on the bookshelf. And I had heard of C, of course. I had an Amiga at that time, I think. And uh, I had a Modula 2 compiler for my Amiga because the cool kids use Modula 2 and I chose that over C partly because a friend of mine gave me his copy in exchange for a, some a video game I think anyway so I, I wanted to learn C and I said I said can I can I borrow this book and the owner Ray he said yes of course take it home if you want so I took that book home, and I read it. <laughs> I will never forget. I have, I have the introduction committed to memory. It says, C is not a large language, and it is not well served by a large book. And that's true. The book is like a pamphlet. And 
it was so beautiful. I've talked to other people about this in the intervening time who have, who have had the same experience of reading that, reading the original edition of the C programming language by Kerninghan and Ritchie and finding it just to be a work of art. Like the, the examples, the, the, the pedagogical style was it completely uh, clicked with me. Uh, and it's, it was so simple. Everything seemed, it's just ideas that I'd never seen before, you know, pointer arithmetic and stuff, and just using, you know, how do you know the length of a string, right? And you have this little, this very simple little function where you just, you know, increment while looking for the zero. And it's just expressed in this, you know, nowadays you'll get that and go, boy, that's, that's a terrible way to do things, right? <laughs> but just to, to learn the ideas behind it, it was presented in such, such, Beautiful, simplistic, sim not simplistic, but simple, clear, elegant, elegant. And it, it just went, I went, I mean, went through that book in lightning speed, and I just fell in love with, with this language and the style. And so, t you know, after that, you know, and then there was college and Unix and everything else, but to uh, find myself this many years later... sitting down and having breakfast on a semi-regular basis with the Brian Kerninghan and having a signed copy of that book with a very nice inscription made out to me personally is something I could not have fathomed would ever happen because these were not, these were not mortal human beings. They were gods who inhabited another plane And then there were all my other heroes, of course, people like Dave Haney, Bill Hurd. Found the cover, it was right in front of me. All right, so somehow I'm supposed to, <laughs> uh, supposed to get this onto there. I should look over and see if somebody's telling me how the hell this works. APL, yeah, we didn't, we had the, I don't, I don't remember if I had like a, a keyboard overlay or if you just, you know, just kept the chart next to the, next to the computer, kept track of everything. APL was sweet. I, I still have a fondness for APL. That's another one, right? Where when you wrap your brain around the thing, it just, it's just so, there's something beautiful about it. Just the concept of just everything right to left and, and, and just the, the, the sort of, mathematical elegance of APL was, was very impressive to me. The code I wrote because uh, he liked, like I said, the owner liked to use APL to just to do when he liked to do math. He liked to do these giant matrix type of thing. I remember him being super impressed by APL because there was like one single character represented doing a matrix division. <laughs> that was always the demo he would show people. He's like, look, <laughs> I can, you know, this one character, I can do a matrix divide. Um, it didn't, it, that didn't impress me so much. But um, anyway, we need, we had all this data that was, that was mostly, they mostly use Microsoft uh, Quick Basic and it was compiled. I can't remember the name of this compiler, but um, it was a pretty sweet compiler, but uh, regardless, uh, Microsoft had their own floating point format that they used. If you saved, you know, you save these uh, files, like random access files from uh, basic fixed, fixed length records, that kind of stuff. Um, and so when you stored floating point numbers in those files, it was stored in the Microsoft floating point uh, format. And the APL uh, system that we had used IEEE floating point. So the guy who, who owned the company, that was what he asked me, like, could you write an import routine so that we can load our, our um, files that we, you know, we process in, in QuickBasic into APL. So to do that, <laughs> this is a long time ago, but I have this vague memory. It's one of these things that's, you know, hard to forget. Um, I, I, there was such bad I.O., right? APL had terrible I.O., especially this implementation. So the only thing you could really do with the file, because it was not like native floating point, but you could process it as 
a giant vector of bits. <laughs> so you can open up a file and treat it as a giant vector of, of, of ones and zeros. And so I would open these things up and read in this, this vector, I don't know however many bits it was, you know, 16 bits or 32 bits or something. Um, and then, you know, treat it as a vector of ones and zeros and then swap the bit positions around because like the Microsoft one had the mantissa in a different place and <laughs> it's just like <laughs> swap the thing around and then and then treat it as a as a float and load it into APL. Um, weird. Forgot all this stuff. I'm really glad I uh, did this project because now it's uh, it's refreshing all these DRAM cells that I haven't used in years. Okay, so uh, my understanding is from this part, uh, it said, um, yeah, it says to uh, put the cover on, push them around, flip around the PCB, check if their legs are the correct side, and solder up all LEDs. This is uh, this is the part where I uh, this is the moment of truth. <laughs> Am I going to commit to doing the next phase of this project, which involves making 128 solder joints? Um, it's 1040. Did I ever use fourth? Um, uh, I used Lisp at that place. Um, I'm not sure. I, I have touched fourth as uh, part of the... Um, uh, when did I use fourth? The, like the, the boot thing, what's that thing you call the EFI or whatever? Um, on Max, like that thing used to be fourth. What did that thing, what's that thing called? On, on Apple computers back, back in the early days. Not, not, not the early, early days, but like the early Mac OS X days before they went Intel. Um, anyway, that was, that was implemented in fourth. I feel like I may have used fourth. Not, not in anger. Not, not like, not like to do a to do a project like the APL and Spitball and Basic. And uh, I don't think we used the um, Lisp f for reals. Like it, 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 it was there. It was on the shelf. He liked to put any, um, you know, any programming language. Uh, he would get. I, I remember because I had an Amiga, right? So I was talking up A Rex, <laughs> and uh, and I, I talked about it. You know, a couple you know a couple days later, he comes over to my desk and plops this giant uh, giant box on my heavy box on my desk. It was a it was a Rex implementation for for PCs, and it had a big thick manual in it. That's why it was so heavy, because back then stuff came with manuals, right? But uh, we used that for a couple, couple things, and and at the time I really I was like I, I had seen this stuff about Linux and I I had printed out like a bunch of stuff. I suggested like we should try this Linux thing. It sounds interesting, but didn't quite actually Perl. Uh, now I was I said Linux, but what I meant was Perl because I must have been, I must have already been familiar with Linux or something. But I I, I remember coming across some stuff about Perl. And I printed all I printed like the entire Perl manual on his. Uh, um, um, dot matrix printer. It took forever, uh, and it would have been great for that place because they did all this data processing stuff. I'm 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 clearly uh, I'm stalling here. I don't really want to turn this over and have something go awry. Um, yeah, Power Power PC. They they were it was Power PC, but the there was a there was a um, BIOS. You know whatever they used to do all the boot booty stuff on the PowerPC Max. It was fourth, and I think isn't EFI like fourth? I don't know. I don't do I don't do any of that kind of. I don't have any knowledge about low level stuff? This is this is the wrong height. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this right on the table. I think I'm gonna go for this. I think this will be the last part that I do tonight, though it's it's almost eleven, and I'm just uh, 
All right, I guess what I can do is I can inspect this to make sure that I've got all the leads around the correct way. So, so far so good. Um, it's always suspicious when you don't make any mistakes. It's good to have one, because then it proves that you can catch them. And they all look they all look to be the right way around. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna go for it. I don't I guess that's why I guess that's why I'm suggesting you do one side because then you can fix it when they're not flush. Yeah, did they call it open something? I don't know. I don't know what they called it. That's the thing. There was some name for it. It was just called open firmware open something. It was beautiful though. It was one of the. It was one of those sad things when they switched to Intel, and uh, always I just really, really never liked Intel architecture it's like it's like a big diesel engine you know it's powerful but uh, ugly a lot of smoke a lot of weight this stems back as well I'm soldering I can tell more dumb stories it's another memory of mine is uh, in college, I took some class that involved some assembly programming. I don't remember what the class was called. Maybe it was, you know, Introduction to Computer Architecture or something, or maybe it was Assembly Programming. But the structure of it was that we we learned about, I, I want to say three, but I can only remember two of them. Uh, I think it was th three different processor architectures. And for each one, you know, a little bit about the, about the ideas behind it, and then, and then the assembly language for that thing. And then we would write some, you know, have some assignments. And I know one of them was Spark. And one of them was x86. And I feel like the third was MIPS. Or possibly RS6000. I'm going to say MIPS. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's not the important one. The important part about this story from sort of my, this is all like, the psychology of what made me who I am, right? A lot of times it's the order of things. Like, going back to the earlier days, I think in the fifth grade they had this, they had this cockamamie idea in the school I was in that we would, uh, You have to choose which foreign language we wanted to study, you know. And this was a very tiny school in the woods of upstate New York, so they really only offered French and Spanish. Very jealous of people who got the opportunity to learn German or Japanese or something, but it was French or Spanish. And they had this idea, here's how they would make it work, right? They would divide the class up in half, and then half of the, of the students, and this was in the fifth grade, would, uh, would learn French, and half of them would learn Spanish. Very, you know, introductory, right? You'd take this basic introductory class. And then halfway through the school year, 
So it was a half year thing, right? And then halfway through, you'd swap. So everyone would get an introduction to French, and they would get an introduction to Spanish. And then you would then decide, you could then choose, you know, after that, after the fifth grade, and in the future, you would choose which one you wanted to pursue for the rest of your academic career. On the face of it seems reasonable. But here's how it went down. I was in the group that got Spanish first. And my Spanish teacher, Senora Porter, would come in with her guitar and she would sing songs and she would bring in treats. So we had all kinds of quote unquote Spanish as Mexican food and she would tell us stories about her trips to Spain and Mexico. She was, a, she was a great teacher and a very interesting person. And the practical upshot of this was, you know, half the year of learning Spanish with Senora Porter. My mind was made up already, right? That I'm gonna, I'm, I'm interested in Spanish. I'm gonna take Spanish. I don't give a crap about French. And now it's like, okay, now it's your turn. Now you have to take half a year of French after you've already made up your mind that you couldn't care less. I don't think I learned one word of French in that entire class. One of two classes I've ever failed. And it was just pointless. So here's this introduction to computer architecture type of thing, I'll call it that, because it's reasonable. And the first thing they present us with is Spark. Right, they talk about, they talk about risk, and they, ex as exemplified by a Spark chip. So we learn all about this, about these ideas, and the pipelining, and the elegance and the beauty of a risk architecture. Because, I mean, at that age, you know, you're, what, 19, 20 years old, you're susceptible to, to notions of, of elegance, big time. You know, it's this, just, kids get into poetry and stuff, you know. So anyway, I'm trying to remember what's what's that thing called, right? Where you have to you put a you put a you have to reorder the last the instruction after a jump gets executed anyway because of the uh, of the pipelining, and so you actually put the instruction you want right before the jump after the jump. That was a little weird, but anyway, this this seemed like a, a, a beautiful a beautiful thing. This Spark architecture, and so you get all into that, and you're like, "Golly gee, this is so clever. This is so so elegant and beautiful." You know, I can really I can really see how awesome this is and how clever this is. And I, of course, of course, you want a minim minimalist instruction set. You want everything, you know, pare it down, right? Who needs, you know, <coughs> subtract when you can just add? Who needs, you know, an or if you can make it out of other things? And you get that you get that idea in your head and you're like, yeah, yeah. I'm down with this. This is this is my this is my new way of thinking. And then they're like, okay. Next. <laughs> next we will introduce you to X86. 
I remember, I remember uh, distinctly, these, these are little moments, right? They stick in your head. I remember encountering the loop. I believe the instruction is called loop. I've never done really x86 assembly outside of this class. But I believe there was an instruction called loop. And, I mean, talk about going down a different path. And it's all like, you know, the other, the other great thing was, you know, you got four registers. So you used to, you, you're doing this thing where it's like, oh, there's all these general purpose registers. And, you know, they're, they're all equivalent. And they're just like, you get 32 of them or something. And they have these great, they're just like R1, R2, R, R7, R9. And then you go, you go to x86, it's like, hey, you have four. And you can't, you can't even use them. You know, they, they're all reserved for different reasons. And this loop thing, like, oh, it looks at this one and compares it to that one. If it's more than this one, it does this other thing. It's like, how the hell is that in its single freaking instruction? What is wrong with you people? I get that it's practical. Every single one of these LEDs is too high. because I didn't push down when I was doing it. I mean, come on, loop. Loop, you make me sick. Loop. Speculative execution. Uh, no, it was, yeah, I was, I was, did you get the satisfying click? I was thinking just that. No, it's not. Speculative execution. I think. No, because that, that's, that's like the specter stuff. That's, uh, that's like branch prediction stuff. This was just like out of order pipelining. So it's like you said, you know, A, B, C, D, then, you know, jump E, F, G, right? You'd expect you do the A, B, C, D, and then you jump somewhere else. But what actually happens is it does the A, B, C, D, E, and then the jump, because the instruction after the jump was already in the, in the pipeline. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure this all changed tremendously um, after pipelines got, you know, deeper and more complicated, but um, at least at this time, sort of these really, there was just like one instruction in the pipeline. Mainframe assembler, uh, it sounds terrifying. But anyway, I got, it just, I just felt like it was, it was so, it was so ugly. Everything about the, the, the x86 instruction set was ugly to me. The only one I actually ever understood, because I, you know, I had a Commodore 64 in my formative years, and a 6502 for, you know, along some of the same dimensions. It's not, it's not like it's pretty. Um, you know, you do, you do have, <laughs> you do have th you know, three, try, you know. Want to count accurately, depending on how you count, right? But you have you have special purpose registers for sure. Um, but the thing about that is that you know there are very few instructions, and you can you can understand them all. They taught us logo in the, like the third or fourth grade or something. Apple twos. And I don't know. I'm trying I'm trying to do math in my head, but let's just let's just call it, you know, thirty years later. Uh I found myself in front of an Apple II that was had logo on it, and I could still 
I can still do it. <laughs> And I, I feel like 6502 is kind of that way. Like, I never really did anything with it, but if you sat me down in front of one now, I could probably make it go. Whereas all I remember about the x86 is that friggin' loop instruction. Not to mention, I mean, Probably like when I say x86, I don't know what the hell which 86 it was, but things have gotten so much more complicated. That's the problem is I can, I can, you know, like anybody else who's, if you've written, you know, if you've written enough code in, in a bunch of different languages, you can pick up an, another one with no, in no time. Just minor differences in syntax and concept, but I still think in Commodore 64 Basic. <laughs> Probably puts me at some disadvantage. school math teacher lent me a copy of The Little Whisper. Talk about a book that can blow your mind. Everybody should read that. <clears throat> a little schemer now, I suppose. <coughs> There's another one, like, I don't know if it's because, you know, I was 17 or whatever, and you're, you know, you're predisposed to seeing meaning in rock lyrics or whatever, but I just read that little whisper, and it was like, I'd never seen anything like that. Is three an atom? Yes, three is an atom. Is foo an atom? Yes, foo is an atom. Is right parenthesis an atom? No, right parenthesis is not an atom. Because an atom is. <coughs> what what a style of teaching. And it's gotta be like if 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 you if you like that, if that works for you then that's the most amazing thing ever. And if you don't like it, then you're probably like, <laughs> you get nothing out of it, no matter how hard you stare at it. <sighs> yeah, see, that's what I mean. CX register. What if I want to keep my high score in the CX register? <laughs> okay, I think I don't know. There's a cover. There's a cover on there. There's a bunch of LEDs in the back. I, I don't know. I think. Um, these, these look like, they all look like they're in right, so I'm just gonna cut the legs off. And 
I think I'm going to call it quits after that. I really appreciate people who have uh, <laughs> sat here with me and kept me company. It's uh, it's uh, it's kind of fun for me. <laughs> Not fun to watch, but it's fun to have people hanging out virtually. Sometimes I put up a video and I get a few thousand views and other times I get three. And I know this kind of stuff can be hard to watch, but then it's what I find myself increasingly watching. I, I don't, we got rid of the TV subscription a long time ago, got rid of cable. Get rid of the satellite. Just watch stuff online. I mean, sometimes, like, we get the HBO so we can watch John Oliver, but um, most of it's YouTube. I just, I love watching real people. I don't like production. I don't like, you know, reality TV where there's, you know, Gordon Ramsay walks into the room and they got to play that sound, you know, like over-dramatize everything. I, I would much rather just watch somebody in their basement soldering. And I do, sometimes I'll put on, you know, <laughs> I put on those Lewis Rossman board repair videos and I can just sit there and watch it for an hour. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Watching, watching a guy do micro soldering. I guess that's kind of like the same as watching people play games, sports, which I never got into. Uh, what equipment am I using to record? Uh, okay, good question. Um, I have a... Um, this camera is just a Logitech webcam. Um, forget which model it is, but it's that uh, popular 1080p webcam. I have a bunch of them, so I can, uh, I've got one hanging above the laser cutter. Well, kind of. It's off to the side right now. Uh, and I got that one, and technically I have one for talent. Um, so this is, uh, these are going into a, um, I picked up one of these IBM, so apparently I can't cut, cut these things and talk at the same time. Um, what the heck is it called? It's got a stupid name. Um, the, uh, what's the little IBM, sorry, not, not IBM, that's why I was confused, Intel. <laughs> Intel NUC. So there's, there's a fancy, uh, like the, the Intel NUC, I think when it first came out, they were little tiny boxes. And then they came out with a, with a model, uh, I don't know, last year maybe, that's, um, it's got a skull on it. It's really stupid looking, but it's this nice little machine that's uh, really powerful. I, I used to be running my capture stuff because these cameras are just hooked up via USB and I'm running them into um, OBS Studio for the switching and streaming. And I had a like a, a Windows all-in-one touchscreen computer that I really kind of like. It's Le Lenovo something or other, which is off to my left. But that, what I liked about that was I had that behind me and I could, like if I'm working on something and I need to view a schematic or whatever, I could just be looking at it. And the, because of the touchscreen, you can pan around and zoom and stuff like that. But it wasn't, didn't have enough uh, juice. So when I would try to do this streaming stuff, it would glitch. So I, I picked up this NUC, and uh, it's a ridiculously powerful machine with like five different, uh, you know, video, like you can do HDMI and USB-C and DisplayPort and all this stuff. Um, so it's, I think it's really designed to drive a bunch of monitors and maybe for gaming and stuff, but 
Um, I find it worked really well as a streaming machine. What did I just do there? Um, it's basically my streaming machine. So, uh, And the solder mask sort of popped off the board. That's weird. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Uh, I'm tired. I've been talking for a couple hours and I'm not making a lot of sense. So webcams into OBS Studio and it's running on the NUC with the skull on the side and there's a control panel that lets you change the color of the skull because that's what the kids want these days uh, does it let you switch sources easily yes yes it does you can do hotkeys and stuff but um i've done what a lot of people are doing for this when i found this product can i get it under the camera this is the uh stream deck from um elgato uh and it's little button thing and you can actually program what all the icons are on this and so when you press these you know you can have it do macros and stuff and then it's got a little stand too so you can set this up to do all kinds of stuff whatever you want it to do basically um, and it's not just for OBS but basically anything you want to press buttons and have it control um, and so that's super handy because if I want to change sources I can just reach over and do that uh, and then on top of that, I've got the, uh, uh, I think I have a whole video about the, about the rest of this stuff, but I've got the Amscope microscope here. So like I can, uh, there's, there's a, uh, USB three video capture box that I'm also using so that I can get the microscope feed. If I press this button, um, Whoa, we are way zoomed in, aren't we? Yeah. So anyway, if I wanted to like inspect uh, what the crap went wrong over there. Um, so this stuff is not, is not currently lined up right to do this at this height. But in any event, I got that set up so I can do the microscope feed if I'm doing like micro soldering stuff. Um, and I find that handy. And yeah, and then there's one other one that's not hooked up right now because it's not on, but I'm a very big fan of my uh, Roden Schwartz RTB 2004. So I can also, when things are working correctly, which they're not right now, but I can set up a browser so I, I can bring up the uh, oscilloscope capture right off of its screen so yeah that's the setup took me a while to get all these things plugged in but my goal is that i can just sit down and work on a project and not have to fuss around too much I thought I would do a lot more of these types of video things. <laughs> it's just so much work. And then I often don't have it. Um, I don't know. I just don't have the thing ready to go. Like this one again. I mean, I start at the beginning. It's like go get a Raspberry Pi and install the OS on it. I just like, I don't know. Should have prepped that ahead of time. I wanted to do one the other day because I, I have this project in, in, midstream uh, a friend of mine has these aquarium lights that have a uh, um, they, they have they have three different colors so you can you can have control the red the blue and the white LEDs and the thing comes with three knobs three pots on it that you can turn to adjust the colors and he wanted to make it computer controlled and I was like oh this is easy um, yeah, I'm just going to keep talking until I shut this off. Uh, no need to uh, continue to hang out. Thanks for, thanks for visiting. Um, 
So anyway, he wanted to know if, if we could like make this somehow computer controlled. And I'm like, yeah, sure, that should be easy, right? We'll just pop the cover off and there will be something super obvious in there. <laughs> I'll be able to do because, I mean, it's like these LED strip lights that everybody has. You imagine it's that style of setup. Um, and so it turns out it's not. Right? I take the cover off and I, after a, a lot of poking around, we spent like an entire Saturday just staring at this, trying to understand how the hell does this thing work. And it turns out it's a... It's a zero to 10 volt, I guess one to 10 volt current sync signaling for well, signaling of uh, light control, which is, I guess, a theatrical lighting standard that is used in theatrical lighting, uh, according to Wikipedia, if you look up zero to 10 volt lighting. But I was totally unprepared. I'd never heard of this. Well, I mean, I'd heard of, I'd heard of zero to 10 volt because I see the connector on the back of lights sometimes, but I didn't know anything about it. So um, a lot of studying and a lot of research, and I eventually understood the way it works is the, the light fixture itself puts out a 10 volt signal and then you pull it down uh, to whatever voltage you want to pull it down to. So I guess it's like constant current supply and that controls the, the brightness of the lights, which is bizarre. Um, and so there's a little, little circuit board on the, the pots that, that you know, uh, operates a transistor to like control the pull down and it's like okay so now I have to come up with how do you do this right and eventually found found a stack overflow or something somebody had a they had a very similar question and somebody have this had this circuit using an op amp and a transistor and um, filter to you know smooth the PWM signal and then use that with the op amp to control the current into the transistor and anyway I, I thought uh, I would do a video about this whole project because it would be kind of a cool thing in explaining how this zero to 10 volt lighting control stuff works. And I could talk about op amps and I could, you know, you can learn along with me because I don't know crap about any of this stuff. Um, but I don't know why I brought this up because it's late and I'm babbling. Uh, it's my point, I guess, that I was going to make is I was going to do more videos and that was an example of the kind of video I thought I would do. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought like this is so dang much work to do justice to the topic. Like I should actually have drawings and schematics and diagrams to be able to show people. So anyway, uh, so I think I got, I've gotten this far uh, and it looks to me, let's just take a quick look. Uh, this is the last thing I'm going to do is see how far. Oh, look, <laughs> all I had to do was was uh, one more part, and then I would have been at the testing portion. Okay, so tomorrow I will get the Raspberry Pi uh, booted up, and I will return to the soldering. I'll finish the rotary encoders, and I will do this initial test part. And then um, it looks like, yeah, switches. And um, wrapping up. OK, cool. So I could actually finish this tomorrow, I think. Although <laughs> it depends. People have been hinting that, that putting the switches on is a huge pain in the ass. But I, I did that with the other one. So I think I have some idea of what I'm in for. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I should have this show this to the breakfast club at work. Um, all right, I'm going to stop talking because I'm just babbling now mindlessly. Um, I shut down the stream, and that was, uh, that was the beginning of the end of the soldering of the thing of the Pi DP11. Man, I'm excited to see this thing work. Uh, the end.